This is from a, a, a <laughs> this is from an epic poem on my commandant but uh, this is from the end of part two. Um, this whole thing is about uh, a Native American called Johnny Who and uh, Arietta's sister said Odyssey. Also uh, Sid and Nancy are in this house in Islington in the seventies. This is the last part before they go off to the future. Um, uh, why they go off the future. Johnny has access to a time machine. This is called De Uber Lebenden, which I'm sure the fellows will correct me, but I think it means the survivors, if I remember right. <laughs> 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 And there was always a thing, and then a space, then another thing, and this could be a body, a book, a cup, a dagger. This appeal is clear. The reader of poems is youthful. Language, this appeal is clear. The reader of poems fully on death, death, death ears, and yet independent of all doctrine. This appeal is clear. The transforming action of poetic imagination, all the disciplined schools of thought at the level of the poetic image, the duality of subject and object is ever iridescent and shimmering unceasingly active in the reader of poems, countless experiments profited by the transforming action of poetic imagination. And to measure the total product of that consciousness, poetic images are content in their immobility. It seems they have no consequences, as is too the case with the transforming action of poetic imagination. Understandable by all this in virtue of embodying the transubjectivity of the image. For example, the word Löwe, lion, occurs once only in the German language, is identical throughout its innumerable, innumerable utterances by all given persons, whereas the assertion of a geometrical object is never thematic. We are like poetic lines being woven into prose, Johnny says. It's an odyssey, a combination of text and image that leaves the doors open for opinion, imagination and thought, and explores the intimate endogenous ambience living wakefully in the world. We are constantly aware of the use rooted, whether we pay attention or not. Conscious of it, the horizon of our lives is a horizon of things, real objects, etc., and so on and so forth. And as Johnny commences his countdown, the old impossible machine, and as he and Zeno leave for Europe after the rain, he squats and gives him nascent. And there are angels with violets for wings who stamp their feet and shriek, six, six for my sorrow, seven, seven for no tomorrow. I forget what eight was for, but nine, nine for the lost gods, and ten, ten for everything, everything, everything. Let's skip, darling Sid. It was only an hopeless fancy. It passed like an April day. But a look and a word and the dreams they stirred you have stolen my heart right away. Mm -hmm. oh, that's <laughs> I, um, I wasn't allowed to uh, put in the book the thing I wanted to put in the book in terms of my reflections on um, pop grew as a thing. So I'd like to read. Uh, not Simon, by the way, I was a publisher. Um, I want to read what I wanted to put in there. It's a quote from Jung on, uh, excuse me, it's a lecture on uh, Nietzsche's Zarathustra, if I remember right. And there really could be no self if it were not in relation. The self and individualism exclude each other. The self is relating. You can never come to yourself by building a meditation hut on top of Mount Everest. You will only be visited by your own gods. And that is not individuation. You are all alone with yourself. And the self does not exist. The self only exists 
in as much as you appear. Not that you are, but that you do is the self. The self appears in your deeds, and deeds always mean relationship. Individuation is only possible with people, through people. You must realise that you are a link in a chain, that you are not an electron suspended somewhere in space or aimlessly drifting through the cosmos. You are part of an atomic structure, and that atomic structure is part of a molecule which, with others, builds up a body. That's problem. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.